Okay, thank you, Leslie. We'll move to the next item. Um, 7.2, the demographic study report. I'd like to invite our demographer. I saw it over. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> Oh, there he is. He's here. Any, um, oh, yeah. Do you have any opening? Um, um, actually, I was, just, <coughs> I was just setting up the, the slides, so let me introduce Tom. Tom Williams is our, our district demographer. Uh, many of you know Tom. Tom's uh, presented to the board uh, several, several years now, and this is our annual update to the board um, as we are going through as our mentioned we're going through a time where we're, our enrollment's changing so um, we always look forward to Tom kind of giving us an update on where we are with our enrollment projections so I'll turn it over to Tom and swipe, thank, swipe away. Thank you Chris. Uh, as you'll see in the next slide which talks about the projections uh, most districts in this county most districts in San Mateo County a lot of districts in Alameda County a lot of districts in Santa Cruz County with the exception of those that have thousands of housing units going in, or the few that still have relatively affordable housing, have declining numbers occurring in the lower grades. This is not unique to you folks at all. Um, they're significant here, uh, but they're significant in a lot of other districts too, particularly in percentage terms. Um, a few such as uh, Evergreen, we're talking numbers in excess of 2,000 in the next five years. So uh, even though these are declining numbers, and as that lady said, they've gone up and down before, this is a um, occurrence that's happening in a lot of locations, and unless you've got an awful lot of new housing going in right now, you've got declining numbers in the lower grades and declining birth numbers. And on that point, I'll go to this slide. I don't know how readable this is to everybody. I thought it'd be bigger than this, but I apologize. That's the way to blow this up, Chris. There we go. Thank you. Um, the first slide deals with what I just discussed, the countywide trends. Uh, the recent trends countywide in most local school districts, other than the few with a lot of housing going in, have been for significant declines both in the totals in the lower grades and the birth totals relevant to the future kindergarten numbers. Um, soaring housing prices, I believe, are the, the factor in this. It's much harder for younger families to get in now than it was even five years ago. Some families that got in five years ago now have their kids coming through the grades, so they're here and they bought in when it was a cheaper time. But the um, youngest families in the apartments, et cetera, and especially the single family attached homes are hard, having a harder time to be here. The next three bullets deal specifically with this district. Uh, for the Cupertino School District, you had a rising enrollment for 19 of the 20 years up till 2013, and you shifted a decline rather quickly since then. Um, in the two years after 2013, you fell by a total of 260 students. In the two years since then, the last two years, you fell by 923 students. That's how radically things changed. And this has been concentrated primarily in the western and southern parts of the district. Actually, the northeastern and eastern parts of the district have been relatively stable or even up a little bit. So that deals with the attendance area issues, the school issues, or focused on those parts of the district. And the bottom bullet in red just says the combination of all the latest demographic study findings results in a projected loss of 478 students in the next year and more than 1,200 students in five years. Since you lost 578 in the last year, that's relatively less decline than what just happened. Um, and these projected losses are concentrated in the southern and western parts of the, of the district. The northeastern section instead adds a few students. On that note, I'll go on to the next slide. This shows again what I just discussed for the <coughs> countywide numbers. This is the TK4 total. The reason I chose TK4 total is because it deals with younger families and it also consistently represents 60 birth months, regardless of whether you're including TK or not over the last 20 years. For the countywide numbers, you'll see they went up until the dot-com boom ended, the dot-com bust came down, and then as the economy soared, the uh, TK4 total soared. I've been doing this since 1985. The rules and demographics have always been that as the economy soared, as jobs went up, as the stock market went up, as people made more money, they tended to have more kids. <laughs> what has happened in this market in the last three years is completely the opposite of that. The price of housing has so overwhelmed everything else that even with all the money being made, less families can afford to live here. And that's what's going on on the right. That's how radically it changed in 2013. And that doesn't even include 2017 numbers, which are down even further. In fact, they're down a lot further. So, what I'm projecting for this district in blue is what happened, as I said, over the last 20 years from 
1993 to 2013, you went up in every year but one, and then you just button hooked and went straight down as the price of housing took off. You see the projected amount still has you going down, but starts to pull out of that a little bit in the long run as the largest classes now in the upper grades pass out of the system, which you'll see in the next slide, there's less likelihood for annual decline thereafter. <coughs> this is what's projected <coughs> on a district-wide basis. Your district has a tendency to add students in the graduation from kindergarten to first grade and from first grade to second grade. And then in recent years, there's been a loss in the net number of kids as a class graduates from second to third and third to fourth and so on. Within that pattern, if all the other tendencies have been the same, if all the other reasonings have been the same, you would expect to see the most kids today in the second and third grades and the fewest today, kids today in the middle school grades. We have the opposite. The orange is the two largest numbers are in grades 7 8. They're going to be out of the system in two years. The next largest totals are in grades 4, 5, and 6. They're all going to be out of the system in five years. The pink totals are all the smallest totals, including particularly that 18, 75, and 3rd. Remember what I just said. Second and third grade have, should have the most kids based on the tendencies of this district. Instead, third has the second least, or after K and first. So what's in the lower grades now are exceptionally low numbers relative to what's in grades 4 through 8. And I've colored these in so you can just see that for next year we go from two orange classes to one orange class in the middle school grades and two green classes to one green class in the elementary grades. So both of them go down. You'll see in yellow down below I've got the elementary is going down by 235 and the middle school is going down by 6, 243. Now with half as many grades in 6, 8 as in K5, obviously that's a much steeper number of kids lost per grade on average. When you get out two years, you'll see that at that point um, we've lost both of the orange classes from the middle school grades, and um, we've lost all the green classes from the elementary grades, and so we've gone down even further. After 2019, the elementary grades continue to just have the pink classes. So their decline starts to become much less significant. Once they've lost those last two green classes, the decline basically is, is much less. But the middle schools continue to lose the larger classes. And it isn't until 2022 when all the classes are pink that they all should be relatively flattening out. So I expect to be flattening out in five years at around 1,200 fewer students. You'll notice that two-thirds of that decline is the middle school level alone. Now, where is this located? I'm going to start with, can I walk away from the mic? Is that okay? I'm going to start with what happened in the last year, which is in the leftmost data column. And a few of the tenement series, particularly those in the West, like Stevens Creek and um, uh, Meyer Holtz, and where's Ray Nunes? Ray Nunes was in 24 in West Valley. They, they lost significant numbers of kids, but the biggest losses were the middle school level. Kennedy went down 163 kids in the last year. That's more than 10% in one year. Lawson went down 122 or 10% in one year. Again, that's the big class is graduating out relative to what's coming in. So even though I'm projecting Kennedy to lose 227 kids, that's less than double in three years. That's less than double what was lost just in the last year alone, put in context. Now, again, because of that bubble moving out and smaller amounts moving in, the bigger losses are at the middle school level. You notice that Hyatt loses essentially nothing because it's in the northeast part of the district. You see, Kennedy's down 227, Newer's down 181, Cupertino's down 135. However, Cupertino, even with that loss, is still over 1,400 kids for the United Tennis Series. Lost to Miller Global 1,000 at that point. It's <coughs> a different impact by the Tennis Series. When I look at the school, the elementary in the southern part of the district, you notice that they're all down severely. Whereas when I get up from Nimitz, Sockelmeyer, and Eisenhower, we're all growing still. Now, I will point out that the growth for Eisenhower is due mainly to the Fort Bay apartments being built. I'll get to it also in a minute in the new housing section. And this district has had a tendency in recent, I don't know what the year was now, was it 2009, I think? 2009 to move apartments out of the Eisenhower attendance area and into the DeVarcus attendance area on a temporary basis because of overloading Eisenhower. If you chose to do that same thing with uh, the Fort Bay apartments, you'll notice that the Eisenhower growth then becomes only 18 more kids in that, and the DeVargas growth instead gets those four bay apartments and puts these two numbers essentially equal in terms of resident kids living there. 
Now, when I talk about resident students, I'm talking about the number of district enrolled students living in that attendance area in the relevant grades. You have a lot of attendance, cross attendance boundary flow because of special schools like Faria and McGolf, et cetera. But I'm still talking about where the district enrolled kids live. Okay. This deals again with where the district enrolled kids live in grades TK8, total students, <coughs> based on the five middle school attendance areas. And in gray is the peak achieved since 2001. And down below is the change that occurred on an average basis from 2010 to 2013. And you'll see that Miller went down a little bit, Kennedy went down a little bit, and Cooper Hill lost and, all, and Hyde all gained a lot on an average annual basis from 2010 to 2013. To see how much things swung in 2013, all of a sudden, Miller started losing over 100 a year, Kennedy started losing over 100 a year, Hyde's gain was halved, Lawson swung from gain to loss, and uh, Cooper Hill's uh, gain became nominal. In the last year, Kennedy again lost 254. Miller lost another 109. And even the areas that were growing, like Hyde swung to loss, and Cupertino swung to loss, and Hyde's loss became much more significant. So this is a happening throughout the district, <coughs> but it's still much more focused on the loss in Kennedy and Miller attendance areas. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. This is based on where the kids in what I call existing housing. It ignores what happened to the limited amount of new housing that was built in the last five years. And in detached homes, which are more expensive, of course, and harder <coughs> to build again, in the last three years, you lost almost 1,200 kids. In apartments, condos, townhouses, and plexes, which I call attached housing, you actually gained nine kids. That's how different the trend has been. People still trying to get in this district are getting into the apartments and condos. They're not getting into detached homes anymore if they're a young family. This is important because if you're talking about a tense area like a Nimitz or a Stockelmeyer or an Eisenhower or a DeVargas, they have a lot of attached housing. If you're talking about a Regnart or a Lincoln or a Myra Holtz or Muir or a Dilworth or Blue Hills, they're all detached homes, they're virtually all detached homes. So this is hitting different attendance areas more than this is. And that's a big factor in why the South is declining faster because there's less apartments. And if I go back six years, You'll notice that we're down over 1,500 in detached homes, down over 700 in K2 alone. That's over a 20% drop in K2 in six years in detached homes in this district. Meanwhile, you're actually gaining kids a little bit still in attached housing. So for the tenant areas that have a lot of attached housing, they're relatively better off. The tenant areas that are almost entirely detached homes, they're in a much more declining situation. And also, these are three great groups. For the detached homes in the district, right now there's almost 3,800 in 6 to 8 and only 2,500 and change in K2. That's two-thirds as many kids. So graduating this out and graduating this up makes a pretty huge difference in the attendance areas that are mainly detached homes. Okay. This is a different birth table than I've presented in this district ever before. Um, there, there are different trends going on, different zip codes, so usually I like to talk about the trends by the zip codes, but in this case I want to talk about the district-wide average for the four zip codes that are mainly in this district. Mainly 94024, 94087, 95014, and 95129. I put the years in quotes because I'm actually dealing with the, the birth period that correlates to the kindergarten five years later. So for example, when I say 2005 births, I'm actually dealing with 11 months a birth in 2005 and one month of birth in 2004 to correlate to the, what qualified for kindergarten a year later. That ratio changed as the kindergarten cutoff date changed. <coughs> but when I talk about from 2005 to 2008 births, they're all over 1,800. When I talk about 2009 to 2012 births, they're all in the 1600s. Think about that for a second. That's a pretty serious drop all of a sudden. The latest year we have data for is all the way down to 1564. That's going from 1938 to 1564. Current kindergarten is at 1678, coming from birth 1678. And you'll notice that here's the K, resident kids, not counting industry kids and kids outside these zip codes. From the 1700s to the 1600s, we're talking getting down below 1500. And I won't be surprised if we get the 2016 birth data, the number's even lower. In fact, it might be much lower. Okay, <coughs> new housing. 
One pause to milk. <coughs> New detached homes, what I call single family attached homes. By that I mean the really huge <coughs> townhouses are single family attached home size, four bedroom, three bath, two car garage. They're averaging over one student every four units. And that's a very high ratio when you see how expensive these homes are. I have a lot of districts where that's half that ratio because of the price of housing nowadays. Regular attached, this is the real shock of this shows how desirable your district is. How much people are determined to get in this district any way, shape, or form. When I talk about the regular apartments, condos, <coughs> and smaller townhouses, you're averaging one student in every three units in the sample of 284 units built in the last five years in this district. In a lot of districts, that ratio is 0.02 to 0.05. In North San Jose, it's 0.02, one student in every 50 new units. In North Sunnyvale, it's the same thing, one student in every 50 new units. This is the highest yield I'm getting from a healthy sample of regular attached units in any district I'm working with in this state. Because people are determined to get in this district and they can find a way to afford this a lot easier than they can afford this. This is the only case I know of where you're actually getting higher yield out of apartments and condos than you're out of single family attached homes and townhouses. Think about that for a minute. The five bedroom and four bath attached homes and townhouses have a lower yield than the two bedroom apartments. That's how true people are in this district. BMR stands for below market rate housing, what people call affordable housing. And that rate is, so, so the three rates in this district are all pretty much around one quarter to one third of a student per unit. <coughs> this is important because we are projecting 1,900 homes in this district <coughs> in the next five years. The big if in that is Valco. I'm sure you all have heard plenty about SB 35 and the impacts of that. Right now, Valco has grandfathered in the right to build, the, the owner of Valco has the right to build 389 units. He wants to build far more. He was voted down in a proposal to build 800 units not that long ago. Nonetheless, under SB 5, 35, it's gonna be very difficult for the city to not allow something to be built there, much more significant than what was approved in the past. Conceptually, it could be over 2,000 units. It would take a lot of hoops for them to get through to get that. But even if they get anywhere near that amount, they're not gonna build that in the next five years. I think the realistic number for the next five years is somewhere around 700, could be anywhere between 400 and 1100, so I'm going to the midpoint of um, 700. If it's 400, then my projection is 100 kids lower across all the grades. If it's 1100, my projection is 100 kids higher across all grades, so it doesn't radically change things. But it is a significant chunk of that 1900 total. And because of that, it's so focused on a few attendance areas, it helps those schools five years out. It does not help the southern schools. It does not help the western schools. So these units are concentrated in a few places like Butcher's Corner, which is up in the Stockholm Minor Tennis area, Valco, the Fort Bay Apartments in the, uh, what do you want to call it, Eisenhower and the Vargas Tennis areas. So they're getting bailed out pretty significantly by new housing. But the parts of the district that have virtually no new housing, the uh, Montclairs, the Stevens Creeks, the Regnarts, the Lincolns, the Muirers, the Meyerholzes, the Dilworths, the Blue Hills, um, they're not getting this bailout at all. So we already have declining numbers going on in those parts of the district that are worse than in the other, than the northern part of the district, and the northern part of the district is getting bailed out by new housing on top of that. And that's why things are much, so much more severe in that part of the district. Questions? <coughs> Thank you, to Tom, so much for the detailed report and also the full report that you presented with our board packet. Um, yeah, do we want to start with, we don't have any comments on this, right? No. Okay. Um, fellow board members, do you have questions? Maybe start with clarifying questions? Clarifying questions, we can start with, well, it is only clarifying because information. Everyone, on, do you want to? Um, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Liang, do you want to start with a couple? Better someone else, I have a lot. Of you can just ask a couple and then we can move on. Okay. So. Three questions, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> So I think Cupertino Union has, uh, student number has increased by 300 per year, almost uh, consistently for 10 to 20 years. But then we didn't have thousands of units of uh, apartments in our district in the past 10 or 20 years. So I don't understand your claim that only district that have thousands of units who have sustaining, have 
stable enrollment. That doesn't make sense because because in our what, history, we didn't have thousands of Because units. what changed in 2013 was the explosion in the price of housing. As I said, I've been doing this since 1985, and the rules that made sense from 1985 to 2013 didn't apply in the last three years. We had people moving in because they could afford to move in. We don't have in net. Now, we still have thousands of people moving in and having thousands of babies. Don't get me wrong. I'm still projecting a lot of kids in kindergarten. But relative to where we were five years ago, it was a lot easier for young families to move into existing housing than it is today. And that's what changed. Do you have data to prove that? Because, for example, we still have a huge number of single-family homes that's three or four bedrooms or more. And uh, do you have data to show that um, we have families, couples, who don't have kids and they are buying these homes? And who are because we don't we don't have we don't have vacancy here. So who are buying all these homes if they are not couples with kids or couples who plan to have kids? Yeah. Who are buying those homes? Again, someone because, is buying. Again, because of yeah, the price yeah. of housing, the people are most prone to buy these homes are two income. Both he and she, or both he and he or she and she, whatever you want to say, um, both of them working with no kids because they have the maximum income with the least expense. But if you're a single mom with three kids, you're not buying a $2 million home. So I'm asking so is, do you have data okay. to prove that Here's data. people who are <laughs> buying homes data. right people now? People buying homes back here were having 1,900 births. People buying homes this year were having 1,500 births. That's a hard number. That's 20% less. But that's affected by the 2008 and 2009 depression when we have lower birth rates. 2015 is affected by the depression? How is 2015 affected by the depression? I mean, this is 2015 births are the lowest on record. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so you order. don't have data to prove that the family is moving in Craig have, is doing a have point less of order. number of children. You point don't have order. any data. Yeah. Point of point of order. Order. Okay. I, I just have to point out our agreement on in, information items is we ask a truly clarifying question. And we they don't start do, clarifying wait, 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 because wait. he's making claims that I don't think I agree with. So I would like to know if he has data to support his so, claim. So Liang, you did ask three questions, and he did give his okay. answers for those three questions. So we're going to move to Phyllis okay. with her questions, clarifying questions, Phyllis. Please. Yes. Um, thank you, Tom. I wish your news were better. I wish we were not declining to that degree, but we are. So I have a qu couple of questions for you that actually came from a community member. Um, and the first one is, given the unpredictability and approvals for the large redevelopment projects, is there a different way to report projected attendance that separates the numbers from existing housing and new developments? Sure, but let me restate that no matter what happens at Valco, no matter what happens at Fort Bay, and what happens at Butcher's Corner, way over 90%, probably way over 95% of the enrollment in this district is going to come from the existing housing. And so it's important at the margin that the new housing is helping the enrollment at the margin, particularly the attendance areas where that is located. And I definitely can break that out. But the, the bigger story here, what amounts to 95% of your enrollment, or 94% or something in that vicinity, is what's going to happen to the housing that already exists today. And so it's important to talk about the new housing, but people think that that's like <coughs> half of the picture. That's not half of the picture. That's not even one, you know, 18th of the picture. So uh, it's easy to say, yeah, I can show you. And yes, if Valco has nothing happen, then the numbers are going to come down by 200 kids in a couple of attendance areas. But uh, the bottom line is that has nothing to do with the attendance areas that we're worried about. And, and in terms of, of, of your facility concern situation, I would interpret that as being the attendance areas that are in decline. And the attendance areas in decline have, for all intents and purposes, zero new housing impact. Okay, and then one more question. Have you, how have you addressed the issue of new project uncertainty in other communities that you serve, specifically those where the scope of new residential development has been on a smaller scale than the large projects that are proposed here? In all studies that I do, I think I say all studies, maybe not for Sequoia High School District, they're a unique characteristic. I will meet with every relative, relevant city planning department and every relevant major active development to find out the best estimates on the timing of when they will be occupied. Now, it's important to emphasize occupied. A lot of people get building permit dates and occupancy dates mixed up. 
When a 500 unit apartment building gets permitted, it's probably a good two years before there's gonna be kids in those units. And uh, the bigger the project, the more complex the project, the farther out it's gonna get. In addition, the farther out a new housing development gets, the more iffy it, it becomes. In 2006, nobody would have ever guessed what happened in the economy in 2009 would have been possible. So things change. So when we get out five, six years, could we have a boom in new housing? Could we have a bust in new housing? Absolutely. Could property values go up another 20%? <coughs> yes. Could they come down 10%? Yes. So it, it, yes, it becomes more of a if the farther out one gets. But when you talk about the new housing for the next three years anyways, it's a pretty firm number. Could a new development of 50 pop up out of nowhere? Sure. Could one development get delayed? Sure. But the overall numbers, you're not talking change in the enrollment of more than 100 kids because of what I'm projecting in new housing in the short term. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you. Kristen, do you have some questions? Yes. Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you for the presentation. It's very informational. Um, and I have a question about uh, the student generate rate. Mm -hmm. New housing? Uh, yeah, the recent building, recent built housing. Yes. So uh, I try to compare to last um, year's presentation you present. And the, um, the SGR uh, is point three two point three zero and 0 0.18. So for the blow market rate, there is a big difference, yeah. so. The BMR, and there's none projected here, so that's why I didn't worry about it. That's mainly an FYI. There have been no, no below market rate developments built in this district in about 10 years. And the one that was built was a little funky thing next to the fire station that's kind of an odd thing anyways. So that's most an FYI number, and the only development I have built anywhere locally in the last 10 years was in Sunnyvale School District in 2016. They just completed it in September 2016. And the right off the bat SGR was 0.18, and I knew that was gonna be low. Because what happens is when a new development first gets occupied, a lot of the kids that are living there get listed at their old address. So when I look in the student file and I say, aha, I only see, I don't know what it was now, 11 kids at the address of that new development, and I get a point one GSTR, I present that to you as an FYI, but I knew that was probably low because it only had been occupied the month before. Now that it's been occupied a full year and kids have updated their addresses, the number jumped to 21. I won't be surprised if that jumps again because usually BMR projects are more like 0.5. But, as you'll see in this next sl slide, I'm projecting no of those units. That was just an FYI slide. The big story, by far, is the attached. Out of 1,900, 1,830 are regular attached. So when we talk about the impact on the projections, all that matters is that 0 0.32. The other twos are just for interest only. What's happening in apartments and condos and smaller plexes is, is, is everything is getting built in the next five years for all intents and purposes. You know, there's little twos and fours and sixes and eights around the district compared to 100s and 200s and 500s in the regular attached. So it's a whole different scope. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, before we, uh, oh, Anjali, have I please. just want to. Yep. Um, thank you. It's always very nice to have you and give us the information. I just want to. I'm just clarifying because what I've heard is the South region has a decline because of there is no new housing going there and cost of housing there is really high and the new housing doesn't really impact our enrollment as such because 94% of our enrollment comes from existing housing. 94 is an approximate percent, but something in that range, yes. Okay. So, um, and, and in an individual attendance area, you plop in 500 units, it's gonna affect that attendance area. But on the district-wide number, it's still a small percentage of the total. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. So, thank you, Anjali. So before we take any more clarifying questions, I just want to reiterate what Craig was saying about this being an information item. We're only asking clarifying questions. And so I think the purpose, my belief is, of why the demographer, we're just listening to the report today. We're not taking any action. We're not having any discussion. We want to know from this demographer what the information is. Later, we will have discussions about what we want to do with this information, or we can also debate in a discussion what we believe is, um, you know, why we each have beliefs of why things are happening, but this is the report that he has given with these numbers. And so if you have, so um, 
So just ask clarifying questions on yeah. this presentation, but what we're gonna do with this information sure. when we talk about that is a different discussion. And before you go, Leah, did you have anything further? Okay, so anyone have further clarifying questions? Okay. So yeah, my questions yeah. are these are things that only Tom can answer. That's why I feel I need to ask when he is here. Okay. Right. So do you so, have any further so, clarifying uh, questions that I you haven't asked already? I, yes, I understand that our housing price is higher, which means more families who might be moving in with older kids. <coughs> so I'm wondering where do you take that into consideration? Because if you only look at kindergarten students, Yes, that might be declining, but then how many families are moving with older kids, especially since our high school district is very highly rated. So are you taking that into account in your calculation? And another factor I think that's Hold on, not let him answer that question okay. first and then we'll ask the next question. A few years ago, don't tell me how long ago now, maybe three, four years ago, you had games as each class graduated the next class. That was families moving in and net, adding kids to each student body class as it graduated upward. In recent years, you have had losses as each class graduated upward above second grade. So when I see a net number go down as a class graduates from third to fourth, and from fourth to fifth, and from fifth to sixth, and from sixth to seventh, and from seventh to eighth, that tells me more families are moving out than moving in. So does that mean our quality of instruction is not keeping the families here? I don't they think that's a clarifying question for the demographer, okay. Liang. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's worrying. I mean, because that means people are moving in when they still have kids in school. And okay, then the next question is, um, okay, I think we, when we have a stable population and even growing in here, and now we, the enrollment should be cyclic, which is understandable because we, we, we have kids graduating out of district would be entering into ninth grade, and then they are still in the district, and they might have college, they be, might enter into college, they are still in the district, they still live here. And even if the kids are 30 years ago, their parents, years old, their parents still live here. So what we are seeing declining enrollment, a lot of it is because we have a bigger <coughs> retirement or, or older working population who are still living here and they will eventually be turned over. Do you have any estimate on the number of, uh, for example, families with uh, parents who are in their 70s, in their 60s, because they are going to be turned over, how we are taking that into account? In the issue is, what generation. does that turnover generate? And when five years ago, that turnover was bringing in young families. Today, it is bringing in fewer young families. We're still having thousands of families moving in, having thousands of kids. But relative to where we stood five years ago, or 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, there are, it is harder for a young family to move in now, or even a middle-aged family to move in now, into the neighborhoods, particularly of detached homes, than it was at almost any point in the past. So when you have a 70-year-old move out, or whatever age you want to ask me about, 60-year-old, 90-year-old, whatever, move out, it used to be that we had a far higher likelihood to have school-aged children and preschool kids moving in than we do today. We still have thousands of families moving in with thousands of kids, but relative to where we were before, less of those homes are having kids than before. And that's showing up in the birth data, that's showing up in the grade-to-grade -grade trend data. You don't really have data on the number of family that's actually Point of moving order, in. Point um, right? is this a question that a demographer can even answer? I'm asking whether he has any data that that's shows not families moving there in. There is no need no for data. me to gather that data. Mm. Okay. How Are about, there, hold uh, on one second, Do you have Liang. data on like uh, Liang, more point of order. families? Liang, just one second. Okay. Um, are the other fellow board members ready to move on from this topic? Wait, Liang, and then if you have further questions, I think you can email them I to Craig. I would like to ask one more question. There are communities who are more affluent than it's us, nice. Palo Alto, Las Altos, and then they do have families who can afford to live there, right? So are you saying single people, I mean couples without children would prefer to live in Cupertino than 
other communities? I'm not going to discuss the community. Because we don't, study. you don't have any data to show that. Well, I have, no, I have yeah. not studied every district on Earth, no. Thank you very much for your presentation, and we will follow up with any questions we have later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.